Okay, so I messed up a little bit. I have three sermons, and, and I'll just go ahead and tell you what those are. Um, but I've decided not to, not to let the uh, mistake just stand. We're just going to go with it. But, but it, is, it is kind of the Christmas season, right? And typically, I mean, we have various things that we look at with that, uh, and looking at the birth of Jesus and, and talk about maybe the Magi or the wise men or kings, and, and maybe talk about the shepherds. We talk about the baby being born. We talk about Mary and Joseph and the interaction. We have all these things of, of options to choose from that maybe we can look at at this time of year, refresh our minds, maybe, maybe be able to share it better with other people. Um, but we're going to look at some that are a little bit different. And, and what we're going to be looking at um, this morning is, and we're going to stick with it because I was really, really going to use this one next week. Um, but, but it's the one that I did give uh, to Debbie and Sue to make sure it got on the bulletin. And that's the one we're going with is and we're going to just kind of switch those weeks around a little bit. It's when angels sang and babies died. And that's what we're going to be looking at this morning. doesn't sound like a Christmas sermon, does it? Um, but that's what we're going to look at. Next, next week, we're going to look at a time to die. A time to die. Believe it or not, it, is, it does connect in. And then we're going to look at 168 hours a week, uh, the, the third week. So we're going to be looking at those three things and see what that has to do with, with the story that we see within the Scripture that we kind of call the Christmas story that kind of gets jumbled up a little bit. Well, we're going to look at some things that are a little bit different. Um, this morning, if you would, turn to Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2. We were looking in this, at this in the, uh, in the teen class as well. Um, we, we were looking at the Matthew portion of this. But, but I want us to, to examine some of this. We'll read the context but we'll look speci specifically at part of this and hopefully make application that can help us within, within life. Starting in verse 8 of Luke chapter 2, it says, And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to men on whom his favor rests. Now, the angels left them at that point. And so we know, I mean, other things surrounding the story, we're not going to read the rest of that right now. But, but we have the angels, and it says the heavenly hosts singing. So even more, I mean, you have the cherubim, the cherubim. cherubim. You, have, you have heaven singing at the fact that this baby is born. This baby that was promised, this Christ the Lord, the Messiah, the, the Savior, Turn back to Matthew chapter 2, and while there's some time frame here, and that's something that the, the teens and I were looking at this morning, there, there were some questions and some, some things that we were examining together about the, the birth of Jesus, and some of this all kind of gets lumped in together, and we, we understand this, that there was kind of a two-year period of things going going on there, of the wise men coming and them going to the, the house rather than going to the manger. And if you're not familiar with that, I mean, you can read more in Matthew chapter 2, and it is so interesting. But we see a time frame kind of happening that, that probably encompasses about two years just by what we're getting ready to read here. Now, Herod had sent the Magi on to uh, Bethlehem. He had he'd inquired, you know, where is this? Where is this supposed to happen? And, and his... His wise people told him, and they, they were quoting scripture about the fact that it was going to be in Bethlehem, that this ruler of the Jews that would shepherd the people uh, would be born. And so, so he sent them on their way, and, and they, were, they were going, following a star, and they, they went on. Well, he told them to come back, you know, let me know exactly where he's at. And he was saying, I want to worship him too. He wasn't wanting to worship this baby. He was, he was wanting to kill him, take him out of the way. He was king. 
He wasn't wanting this baby to be born to be king. And so there was, there was ulterior motive that was going on here. They, they were revealed in a dream. Don't go back. And so they didn't. Now, with all that happening, in verse 13 of Matthew chapter 2, it says, When they had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said. Take this, the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. So he got up with the child and his mother during the night and left for Egypt, where he stayed until the death of Herod. And so was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet, Out of Egypt I called my son. When Herod realized that he had been outwitted by the Magi, he was furious and he gave orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem and its vicinity who were two years old and under in accordance with the time he had learned from the Magi. Then what was said through the prophet Jeremiah was fulfilled. A voice is heard in Ramah weeping and great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted because they are no more. So he had this time frame because he had learned from the Magi. I mean, they've been following this star. You know, you're traveling across country. You can't fly. You can't take a train. You can't take a car. You're walking. And so this time frame there, every baby boy two years and younger, that's not a happy time. The mothers of Israel, even as it says, Rachel weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted because they are no more. There's great weeping. There's great mourning that is happening. How do you, how do you put this together? The angels are singing at the coming of the Messiah. The angels are singing because this one baby is born. Lying in a manger, if you will. But what did this cause to this nation of people? But the death of all of these babies, these baby boys. You know, it's, it's easy to kind of distance ourselves from that. It's easy to kind of lay that part aside. I know just, just the... You got a baby on the way, right? I mean, there's a, there's a grandchild coming. We've got a baby on the way and excited because, you know, movement's happening and all that kind of stuff. Our, our son and daughter-in-law, I mean, Melissa, they've got a little baby boy right now in foster care and have had him for a few months now. Just as cute as a bug's ear, you know, just a neat little guy. If we, would, if we would make the connections of the children that we have had or the grandchildren we have had or the babies that we've been able to hold and, and watch and see them grow and see the, the experience, two years and younger, angels were singing, babies were dying, all because of the same event. What do you do with that? How do you reconcile that? How do you, how do you console with that? We have to somehow use what God has given us within Scripture, within scripture to see as God sees and to know what He knows as He reveals to us. From a world's perspective, you can't justify. From a world's perspective, from, from the physical side of things, you can't fully wrap your mind around that. And that's part of what, when, when Paul's talking to the Corinthian Christians, and he's, he's saying, you know, who can know the mind of another man? Well, nobody can know the mind of another man any more than... than the idea of knowing the mind of God. But he says we have the mind of Christ because we have his spirit. 
And so he has given us things that we can understand. And even the Spirit putting things down in these words here, we can see that throughout time, God has utilized people and he's, he's used their lives to bring about what's necessary to save mankind. There are familiar stories to us, and, and if you've been in Bible classes, if you maybe, maybe you grew up in church and maybe you didn't, but there are stories, different stories that you've probably heard regardless, like the story of Joseph. And when, you, when you think about the story of Joseph, it's, it's, it's neat to kind of think of the end result where, you know, he's second in command in the kingdom. I mean, he's right up there with Pharaoh because Pharaoh placed him there because of, of what God had revealed to him that he could do for that nation, and he did it. And he even made provision for Joseph's family to come up and to have somewhere to be, this land of Goshen, this area that they would grow into a people, and they did. Now, there are other things that follow that, but if you just, if you just stopped at that point and you see how, how Joseph was blessed, but it didn't start out that way. In order for Joseph to be blessed that way, his brothers had to sell him. His brothers had to talk about whether or not they were going to kill him because they hated him because his father loved him more than he loved all the rest of them. And so they took the coat, they, they soaked it in goat's blood, they brought it back to his father and said he was killed by a lion or killed by a beast. His father was heartbroken. Think about what Jacob went through for all of those years while Joseph grew up the rest of the way. The heartache that was there for Jacob. Thinking his, his son was dead. Think about Joseph. I mean, he, he, was, he was cast into a pit until here was a, a caravan passing by, headed to Egypt, and, and they, they sell Joseph. I mean, it's better to make some money off of him rather than just kill him, right? So they sell Joseph, and he goes down there, and you see things start to get kind of good. He's a good manager. He's managing a guy's household as a slave. You know, Potiphar is, is, is proud of this nice young man that he's got now until his wife goes after him. And then he's cast in prison. I mean, just bad and you see God continually raising him up and blessing him. But it doesn't take away from the bad things that happen and when they happen, how that has to feel. I mean, you can start picking out the various times that God throughout the history, and, and God was building a nation, and he had made a promise to Abram, later called Abraham. But he'd made a promise to him because of his faith. He'd made this promise to Abraham that he would bless all families of the earth through his offspring. But he didn't have any. And so he had to bless him with a son. But it wasn't without turmoil that went along with it. And some of that turmoil even came um, from Abraham's decision and Sarah's decision themselves. But, but a son was born. And because that son was born, then, then you, have, you have a grandson, which is Joseph, being born. And then all of this happening that he's building a people. And then the people being led. I mean, you see the things, if, if you pick David, for example, King David, he wasn't always king. He started out a, a young boy and, and coming up. I mean, he was anointed king even when he was still young. Didn't mean he was ready to take the throne or took the throne because he didn't. Saul was still there. And while he was able to do some good things, Saul began to get jealous of him. And, and so what was happening then was, I mean, along with the king trying to kill him, I mean, personally, you know, throwing things at him, trying to pin him to a wall, and and. It didn't happen, but he had to run. And even though he was a mightier, war, mighty warrior as it came about, he found himself fleeing from the king. Opportunities to kill him himself, but he didn't because he was God's anointed. He wasn't going to lift his hand against him. And the times that he had to live, I mean, you ever thought about living in a cave for a while? You know, not, not really the most pleasant circumstances. I 
and there were people died. All because God was going to bless Israel. All because he was going to set one on his throne, David, that would call the man after my own heart, God said of him. Didn't mean he was perfect. It's not what he was saying. But he believed God. He had faith in what God had promised. As you read through the scriptures, and go to Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. It all points to this time that God was going to be able to bless all people through the Messiah, through the Chosen One, through the Savior. Hebrews chapter 11. We're going to read in this chapter a little bit um, because I've just picked out a couple, but we're going to cover a little a few more a little bit faster. Starting in verse 1, he says, Now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. So faith, and, and a lot of us know the King James, the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen, right? I mean, where it's, it's, it's one that probably a lot have learned a long time ago, but it's being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. So if, you, if you're wanting to have faith in something, don't demand that you've got to see it before you can believe it. It's that belief that is there. It's that assurance of it being there before you can see it. It says, this is what the ancients were commended for. By faith we understand that the universe was formed at God's command so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. By faith, Abel offered God a better sacrifice than Cain did. By faith, he was commended as a righteous man when God spoke well of his offerings. And by faith, he still speaks, even though he's dead. He offered a better sacrifice, and he got killed for it. You see how we can, we can reconcile that, because it didn't mean that he lost eternally. He was pleasing to God. What Cain decided to do was wrong. And it was sin. But do you blame God for what Cain did? I mean, you look at the circumstance. It wasn't, it wasn't God doing that. It was Cain doing that. By faith, Enoch was taken from this life so that he did not experience death. He could not be found because God had taken him away. For before he was taken, he was commended as one who pleased God. And without faith, it is impossible to please God, because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. By faith, Noah, when he warned about things not yet seen, in holy fear built an ark to save his family. By his faith, he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. Noah had faith. Because of that faith, he and his family were saved. What happened to everybody else? Wiped out. Everybody else. There's eight people. It was their choice. By faith, Abraham... When called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went even though he did not know where he was going. By faith he made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents as did Isaac and Jacob who were heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to a city with foundations whose architect and builder is God. Let's jump on down just a little bit. In verse 13, all these people were still living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance. And they admitted that they were aliens and strangers on earth. People who say such things show that they are looking for a country of their own. If they had been thinking of the country they had left, they would have had opportunity to return. Instead, they were longing for a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. Did you notice this? If they would have been thinking about the country they left, I mean, maybe speaking specifically about Abraham, 
I mean, he goes deeper than that, and he's going to mention some more. But if, if you want to set your mind on what you've given up for Jesus Christ and set your mind on those things, and this is what I've left, and this is, this is what I could have had, well, you're probably going to get to go back to that. That's what you want. He, they could have gone back home if they wanted to. They could have had that back. Do you really want that back? But they were looking for something greater. They were looking for the heavenly. Therefore God, in, in, again, in the latter part of verse 16, therefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. By faith Abraham, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. He who received the promises was about to sacrifice his one and only son, even though God had said to him, It is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. Abraham reasoned that God could raise the dead, and figuratively speaking, he did receive Isaac back from the dead. Abraham worked this out in his mind because of his faith. In, if he didn't have faith in God, he would have never done it. But God told him, you offer up Isaac for a sacrifice to me. Does that sound like God? Human sacrifice? On the altar? But Abraham was willing to do it. And what does it say he was able to reason within his mind? I mean, if he could bring Isaac to begin with to him, when Sarah was barren and he was old and they could have a son... He knew if God could do that, God could bring somebody back to life. So yes, I can offer my son on the altar because I know that God can still give him life. And he has promised me that it's going to be through him that I'm going to have all of this offspring. I'm going to have grandkids and great-grandkids and it's going to grow into a nation. He really believed it. Before it ever happened. Do we really believe it? says, figuratively speaking, he did receive Isaac back from the death. By faith, Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau in regard to their future. By faith, Jacob, when he was dying, blessed each of Joseph's sons and worshipped as he leaned on the top of his staff. By faith, Joseph, when his end was near, spoke about the exodus of the Israelites from Egypt and gave instruction about his bones. By faith, Moses... Moses' parents hid him for three months after he was born because they saw he was no ordinary child and they were not afraid of the king's edict. By faith, Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose to be mistreated along with the people of God rather to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a short time. He regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ as of the greater value than the treasures of Egypt because he was looking ahead to his reward. By faith he left Egypt, not fearing the king's anger. He persevered because he saw him who is invisible. By faith he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood, so that the destroyer of the firstborn would not touch the firstborn of Israel. By faith the people passed through the Red Sea as on dry land. But when the Egyptians tried to do so, they were drowned. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell after the people had marched around them for seven days. By faith, the prostitute Rahab, because she welcomed the spies, was not killed with those who were disobedient. And what more shall I say? I do not have time to tell about Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, and the prophets. Or who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, and gained what was promised who shut the mouths of lions, quenched the fury of the flames, and escaped the edge of the sword, those weaknesses was, was, whose weakness was turned to strength, and who became powerful in battle and routed foreign armies. Women received back their dead, raised to life again. Others were tortured and refused to be released so that they might gain a better resurrection. Some faced jeers and flogging, while still others were chained and put in prison. They were stoned. They were sawn in two. They were put to death by the sword. They went about in sheepskin and goatskins, destitute, persecuted, and mistreated. The world was not worthy of them. They wandered in deserts and mountains and caves and holes in the ground. These were all commended for their faith, yet none of them received what had been promised. 
God had planned something better for us so that only together with us would they be made perfect. This all happened for you. Did you ever think about that? They they didn't see the promise. They didn't see the child born. They didn't see the the young man grow into a man of 30 years old and stand up in a synagogue and read about himself in the prophets before he sat down. They didn't hear him <coughs> preach on the side of the mountain about what was coming and, and how he needed to worship God not just in the flesh, but in the Spirit. They didn't hear Him teach about the Holy Spirit. They didn't hear Him talk about forgiveness that would come, that would be like a, a well of water springing up within you. They didn't hear the Messiah, nor see Him. Peter says we're blessed because we haven't seen him. We weren't there when he was walking here as a man, but we believe anyway. But we can hear the words. We can see the teachings. We can make the applications, even from those who have gone on before, these that we've been reading about, that horrible things happen to. See how we put that together. It was all in the name of the Messiah. Because there are better things waiting. There's better places. There's more than the here and now. An impatient of baby boys dies that are two years old and younger. For us it hurts, not for them. Because we believe in something better. We believe in something more. If that's what it took for Jesus to come so that we could have something better. Because with him, we none of us could have it. You guys want to come up to stand? So there was a time when angels sang and babies died. Sometimes we just think of Jesus' death. Part was done because of our sin as the part that was done so that we could be delivered from it because he became sin for us as Paul said in 2 Corinthians but when we think of the whole scope of things from the time that Adam Eve sinned within the Garden of Eden that a promise was made in chapter 3 that bruises would happen and while his heel would be bruised Sacrifices were made from time, even until the end of time, for us to be able to stand before the throne of God, righteous, because He is righteous. That's the reason He came. So if you will, it's part of the Christmas story. If you haven't given your life to that, maybe if you've been holding something against him because of something bad that has taken place, all of these people were looking at something that was invisible, something they couldn't see, something they couldn't put their hands on, realize that there is more for you, something that you can't put your hands on right now, something that you may not yet have experienced, but the promise is there and the promise is in Jesus his son that same baby who did lie in a manger 
you need to respond to that. Come as we stand and sing today.